Well, good morning to everyone out there listening on or watching on YouTube. I'm still not used to this, uh, standing here uh, in uh, an empty uh, sanctuary. Um, but uh, it is uh, good to be able to uh, communicate in this way. And uh, uh, hopefully it won't be much longer uh, that we are in uh, this uh, situation, but uh, we know that God is in control of all these things and that God uh, will uh, make things happen in His time, and so we look to Him. Uh, while we may not understand, we know that He is the one uh, who is sovereign over these things, and He is the one that we gather today uh, to worship. And so, uh, let, us, let us gather in and worship uh, the one who made us, the one who sustains us, and the one whom we will worship uh, forevermore. Let us uh, open uh, in a time of prayer, and then I will open God's word for us uh, today. O oh, gracious God, we do thank you that you are the sovereign creator sustainer and keeper of your people and keeper, O oh Lord, of your precious promises. Especially, O oh Lord, we see your faithfulness to us in Jesus Christ, who came in the fullness of time to redeem sinners like us and to uh, give us a, an identity uh, greater than our own, an identity that is only found in you. And so, O oh Lord, as we gather this morning in our various places, while uh, we regret that we are not able to gather together in one place uh, in person, uh, Lord, we know that where we are, there you are with us. And so, O oh Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts as we gather around your word, as we gather to worship you as you deserve, O oh Lord. May you fashion us and form us in this time in a special way that, Lord, we would know you better, that we would grow, O oh Lord, in all facets of our lives and especially, O Lord, in our faithfulness to you. May your spirit work in our hearts as your words of truth speak to us. And may we, O Lord, be conformed to your truth this day. May you give me, O Lord, the words to speak. May you give your people the ears to hear. And may you, O Lord, receive the glory that is due your name. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, today we're going to continue our sermon series on the Psalms, as we particularly have been looking at the Psalms of Lament, or at least uh, some of the Psalms of Lament, even though last week we, we didn't look at a Psalm that would technically be categorized as a Psalm of Lament. Uh, but, but nevertheless, we saw in that psalm, as we've seen in all the psalms that we have been looking at, the, the struggle, the heart struggle of God's people in trying to understand the plan and purpose of God in the midst of various times of difficulty, hardships that God's people may encounter along the journey. And that is one of the things that I think we find great value in the Psalms and particularly uh, the Psalms of Lament. I know it's been instructive for me and I hope uh, for you as well is that when we look at these Psalms, we, we get to look behind the curtain a bit to see what is going on in the heart of the psalmist as they wrestle with those difficult questions in difficult 
circumstances, right? When they ask questions of why and how long, right? Why, O oh Lord, have you allowed this calamity to come upon your people, right? How long, O oh Lord, will you allow this circumstance to continue? And as we've looked at these psalms and entered into that experience, we've, we've seen that, you know, sometimes it's because God's people need correction, right? Sometimes there's sin in the camp that needs to be dealt with. And so there's a, a call to repentance and renewed faith in the promises of God. You know, in some sense, I think we could say that repentance and renewed faith is something that is always necessary for God's people, since it is the call of every Christian in every place, every day, to repent and to trust in Christ. And so there's always, there's always sin in our life that needs to be put to death. But sometimes, as we've seen in these psalms, it's not some uh, particular sin that is being dealt with. But we see that sometimes God allows these circumstances. He allows us to go through certain difficulties so that we might, uh, as the scripture says, enter into the sufferings of Christ. So that we might be sanctified and rejoice in the glory that is to be revealed. That's what 1 Peter 4 says. And we do that all for the glory of God, for the sake of his steadfast love. And so this morning, we're going to look at a passage that deals with these kinds of questions, which actually asks both why and how long, as we see God's people enter into a very dark time in their history. And it is Psalm 74. Let us read the, the word of the Lord together. O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees and all its carved wood they broke down with hatches and hammers, hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire they profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. They said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, but there is none among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff, is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Yet God, my king, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan, who gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs, and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have regard for the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. 
Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. Do not forget the clamor of your foes, the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. Well, this is the word of our God. Thanks be to God for his holy and inerrant word. Well, the psalmist here is writing about a very dark time in the history of God's people. The words here are associated with 586 B.C., which some of you uh, will remember is one of those years in the history of God's people that is never going to be forgotten. Maybe it's kind of like 2020 in some sense. I I say that uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, of course, because there's really no comparison between the severity of what happened in 586 B.C. and what uh, we are, are going through today. Although we certainly can learn from the experience of God's people, and we will, Uh, back then to help us navigate the circumstances that we face today for the glory of God. 586 B.C. marks the destruction of Jerusalem. It's the year that the Babylonians came in and sacked the holy city. They destroyed the temple and carried carried off God's people into captivity in Babylon. And so that is the context in which the psalmist is expressing the words of this psalm, or at least the experience that he is addressing as uh, he wrestles through that, uh, the issues that are discussed here in this psalm. Now, the description at the beginning says that this is a psalm of Asaph. And you may remember last week that we looked at the first of a series of psalms uh, by Asaph that that are included in uh, the canon of Scripture. Um, But if you remember, we we mentioned that that Asaph uh, lived during the time of David and Solomon, which is... uh, several hundred years before uh, 586 B.C. So how could this be a psalm of Asaph? Well, uh, there's different opinions. Some might suggest that he wrote it prophetically. But what most commentators believe is that uh, that there was a group of temple singers and musicians in the tradition of Asaph whose writers and music would thereby be identified as psalms of of Asaph, the tradition, as it were, of Asaph. But nevertheless, we see this is a communal lament rather than an individual one, and so it expresses the experience of God's people, the community of God's people as they wrestle through these difficult circumstances. Right? They are the, the words of God, inspired by God, through the servant of God, for God's people in every generation to equip us, as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, for every good work. And so this morning, we're going to look at this psalm. We're going to look at it in two parts. First, the devastating destruction of sacred signs And secondly, remembering the covenant faithfulness of God. So to begin with, the devastating destruction of sacred signs. Well, in verse 1, it uh, starts out, the psalmist is crying out to God, asking him, you know, why has he allowed this to happen? And expressing what may have seemed to be uh, the reality of things, at least from his perspective, that this 
was a permanent rejection from God, right? Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Now we know from other places in Scripture the answer uh, to uh, these questions. We know that, for example, that the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of God's people in 586 and, and the years leading up to that uh, was because of Israel's continual disobedience and breaking of their covenant with God, right? You can read about that in the prophetic books of the Old Testament and uh, maybe particularly with respect to this uh, situation, Jeremiah. But also we know from the unfolding of uh, redemptive history and the rest of Scripture that this exile was not a permanent reality. It was 70 years before the restoration of God's people uh, began, right? When the Israelites were allowed to return to the land. But when we say that, right, we, we, we say, well, it was only 70 years. We, we shouldn't say that in a way that removes us from the pain, the, the tragedy of that experience, right? The, the severity of what the Israelites underwent, regardless, you know, of, of the fact that uh, they had broken the covenant. And so this was a, a consequence. Yes, it was a, a consequence of their sin. And yes, it was re repentance was needed before they could be restored to the land. But think about what was happening, right? We, we, we need to remember the, what the temple was, what Jerusalem was, right? It was the, the center of religious life. It was the, the place where God met with his people in a special way. It, it was right where they worshiped God and experienced God in a way that could not be experienced anywhere else. But now they were being cut off from that. And not only that, but the, the place itself was utterly destroyed. And so the psalmist is, is, is looking at that and He's in despair. Why do you cast us off forever, Lord? Right? Why, why are you so angry with your sheep? I mean, we're your covenant people. I mean, we know, of course, like I've already said, that this was a consequence of their unfaithfulness. But from the vantage point of the psalmist, this was utter devastation. I mean, even if he knew that the exile was only going to last for 70 years, and uh, the book of Jeremiah does indicate that, but it doesn't seem that he necessarily understands that in, in this psalm. But... It meant that he probably wasn't going to return to the holy city, the temple in his lifetime. I mean, consider that for a moment. Right? I mean, we haven't been able to gather in our sanctuary for almost three months, and it certainly has been a difficult thing to not be able to worship God in the manner that we are accustomed to, right? To, to sing together, to, to pray together, to partake in the Lord's Supper together. And no, it's not the consequence of unrepentant sin, but think about not being able to gather for 70 years. 
That's what the psalmist is wrestling with here. And then in verses 4 through 8, he goes into more detail about what had happened to the sanctuary of God. He says, Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees. And all its carved wood they broke down with hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. They said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. As one commentator summarized, <clears throat> instead of hearing that blessed priestly benediction in the sanctuary they heard rather the roaring of the enemy instead of the signs of god's presence among them they saw the pagan signs of devastation and idolatry everything that had served as a sign of God's presence and protection of his people had just been removed. And this, of course, brought the psalmist to that place of lament, that place of despair, as the community together was devastated in verses 9 and following express that we do not see our signs <clears throat> there is no longer any prophet there is none among us who knows how long how long O god is the foe to scoff is the enemy to revile your name forever in other words lord how long is this going to happen have you permanently rejected us lord we need those signs and seals to remind us of your power and presence in our lives the we, they, they comfort us in a world of chaos and destruction why have you taken them away well perhaps you've felt that way in recent weeks Longing to gather in the sanctuary of God, to partake of those blessed means of grace within the context of the assembly of the saints, to, to see and hear and feel the grace of God through those signs that he has given us. And if you long for that, that's a good thing. It's good to know that you are missing something when you cannot gather with the people of God, when you cannot worship in the way that God has designed. I mean, if you don't feel like we're missing anything, then something is very wrong. But this psalm also should give us a right perspective, or at least help to give us a right perspective on things i mean for one thing we know that god has not forsaken us we know that god has not sent us off into exile maybe it feels that way a little bit but he hasn't and we've not been separated from the signs and the seals of god's covenant with us permanently and not even for 70 years but also, this psalm provides that important perspective that we need in pointing us to what we must do when those signs are removed. And that brings us to our second point, remembering the covenant faithfulness of God. And notice the language throughout the psalm, the the psalmist continually appeals to God's covenant with his people, his intimate relationship with those whom he loves. 
In verse 1, he refers to God's people as the sheep of his pasture. In verse 2, he refers to them as his congregation, right? The, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. In other words, Lord, there's a lot going on around us. But we know that we are your covenant people. We are your special people, the ones on whom you have placed your love, whom you have redeemed to be your kingdom of priests, your holy nation, your treasured possession among all peoples. So do not forget us, Lord. Remember us. Redeem us for the sake of your holy name throughout the earth. And in verses 12 through 17, the psalmist recalls God's covenant with his people and his faithfulness in redemptive history, summarizing God's mighty acts in creation and redemption. And he, and he says these words, Yet God, my King, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. In other words, it's all yours. And commentators, of course, will point out that, and it seems pretty clear when we read it, we hear and hear both of the creation story and the story of, of Exodus, right? The, that, that beautiful story of redemption in the Old Testament as God delivers his people. And we hear it, for example, right in verse 16 and 17 regarding the creation. Yours is the day, yours the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun, fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. In other words, Lord, you have created everything. And you have established everything according to your eternal wisdom. Right? You have divided the sea by your might, reminding us of the Exodus. But also there's some, some interesting language in here. And again, commentators will point out that it's the language of this an ancient Near Eastern myth in which... Baal, the Canaanite god, fought and defeated the sea god and thereby gained supremacy over the earth. But the psalmist here uses this imagery, as it were, to say that Yahweh, the god of Scripture, is the one who defeated the sea monster, the sea monsters, or Leviathan. You say, well, what, what's going on there? Well, first of all, we need to understand he's not endorsing that ancient myth story, right? But what he is saying is this. He's saying that our God, the God of the Bible, is supreme over every other so-called God. Not that they are legitimate gods or, or rival gods, but the one true God, the God of Israel, is supreme over all. He is the creator and redeemer. And though in this circumstance it may seem like the gods of this world, the powers of this world are succeeding and though it may seem that chaos is reigning supreme over all the earth, God is still in control. 
God is still the one true God, the creator and sustainer of all things. He is the only hope for mankind. He is the only hope for salvation. And nothing happens apart from his sovereign plan and purpose. But all is not in control of their circumstances. The Babylonians who just carried them off into exile are not in control of their circumstances. Only God is sovereign over these things. Yes, you may be carried off into exile for a time, but God is saying, I am still with you if you trust in me. I am still your God, and you are still my people. Trust in me. And you see, that was critical for God's people to remember when they looked around and it seemed like everything around them had crumbled. When the signs of God's power and presence, the temple and the promised land in their understanding of things had been removed. And you see, brothers and sisters, it is just as important for us to remember this as well. That no matter what it looks like is happening in the world, no matter how much it seems like things are uh, going out of control, God is in control. God is working his plan and purpose through what may seem to us to be chaos. He is still our God and we are still his people. And God is the only one who can bring true hope, true salvation in the midst of the earth, as verse 12 says. You see, God is faithful to his covenant. He had been faithful to his covenant, even in allowing his people to be exiled for a time for their disobedience. He has been faithful to his covenant throughout history and he will continue to be faithful to his covenant to his people forever. The psalmist seems to have understood this. And that is why he calls upon God in the midst of these dire circumstances. Have regard for your covenant, he says in verse 20. For the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy us praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. You see, he's calling upon the covenant goodness and faithfulness of God, appealing to God to act in accordance with his character, according to his plan and purpose in the world. Because he understood that God is the only one who could save him, who could save the people, the only one who had the power to truly act and affect his purposes in the world. You see, the psalmist remembered who God was, what God had done, and trusted in the promises of God, knowing that God's will would be done. Right? Despite what things might have looked like in the world in which they lived. And that, dear friends, is what we must do as well. Remember who God is, that he is good and faithful and sovereign over all things. We need to remember what God has done 
Not just that he created all things and delivered his people in ages past, but how he has accomplished our redemption in Jesus Christ, who is not just a sign of God's presence, but God himself dwelling with us and offering himself to bear the full judgment of God for our sin so that we might not be exiled for our sin, but redeemed by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But also because of what Christ has done, God is present with us wherever we are. His Spirit abides with us, strengthens us, equips us day by day. We need to remember that. And so while we long for the day when we might see each other face to face, right? When we can see again the signs of God's grace before us. Let us remember who God is and what God has done. Let us remember the covenant faithfulness of God, that he is our God and we are his people and he is with us even now, wherever we are. But even more, than longing for the day when we might see each other face to face. Let us long for the day when we will see him face to face. And we will enter in to our eternal rest. We will know the fullness of the blessings of the covenant in Jesus Christ forevermore in his eternal kingdom. Let us look to him, O Lord, for he is our God, and we are his people, and he is with us forevermore. Let's pray. O gracious God, we do thank you that where we are, there you are in our midst. That, O oh Lord, you do love us. You have set your affection upon us. And you, O oh Lord, will never, never let us go. That you, O oh Lord, have a purpose in all things. A purpose for good. That we, O oh Lord, might know you better, that we, O oh Lord, might be conformed to the image of your dear Son, and that you, O oh Lord, might be glorified through our lives and the world, the events of the world. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would find a renewed hope in you, knowing, O oh Lord, that you are faithful and that you will see us through to the end. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us now rise for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.